right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jamie Keach from the Resource Insider Podcast. And today on the podcast, I am going to be having a conversation with David Browning, the VP Exploration of Westward Exploration. This is a position in my portfolio. I was one of the earliest investors in this company, uh, gold exploration in Nevada in a very exciting area with a lot of historical work done. I would say, and the reason I wanted to have Dave on here today, this is the most undervalued position that I have in my portfolio right now. When you look at what this bloody thing is trading at compared to the work these guys are doing, the assets they have, the depth of experience on the team, the board, the advisors, this is something I'm both extremely excited about and extremely frustrated by because of the amount that it's been hit by this pullback in gold. And if you guys have been listening to the Resource Insider podcast for some time now, you know that we see this massive market pullback in gold. The GDXJ is down something like 30% to date as a buying opportunity in the sector. This is one of the ones that I own. I'm excited about it. So I'm excited to tell you guys about it. Rant over. Without further ado, let me please introduce Dave Browning. Dave, thanks for taking some time out of your day today. Yeah, Jamie, thanks for having me. That's quite the introduction. We uh, we feel the same way, so I really appreciate all that. So, um, for sorry, those sorry, Jamie, met... just really quick. It's actually going to be Westward Gold. Westward Gold. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, <laughs> we're changing from IM Exploration to Westward Gold. So that yeah, was the previous name. All right, yeah. my apologies, guys. That's on me, not on Dave. Obviously, thank you for uh, the heads up. Westward Gold. For those who've never heard of Westward Gold, Dave, can you kind of give us the 30,000 foot view of what it is you guys are actually trying to achieve out there in Nevada? Yeah, absolutely. So you probably haven't heard of us because we're brand new. I mean, really, that's come together this year in 2021. Um, we were IM Exploration, as you mentioned, uh, and it's been a consolidation of two really key land packages in Nevada. So there was a company called Momentum Minerals that had the Turquoise Canyon property and IM Exploration had the adjacent Toyabi and we've merged those two companies together to make Westward Gold. And this land package is um, really aggressive. It's about 3000 hectares. It's right in the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. And it's really, it's in the heart of the Barracks Cortez district. So we're, we're really excited about it. We're a young company. Um, we're doing a lot of new and exciting things and doing a lot of uh, good field work as well. So um, we think we have a good opportunity. So Dave, one of the things that stood out for me uh, about Westward, about these projects in particular, is you guys kind of have this, you mentioned a large 3,000 hectare land package, but notably it surrounds a past producing mine. Is that correct? And one that is currently owned by Barrett Gold? That's correct. Yeah, so it's adjacent to the Saddle Mine, which was a 90,000 ounce producer, um, originally found by uh, Homestake and Barrett took it over and not only that, but our entire land package is surrounded by Barrick as well. As I said, we're in the heart of their kind of Cortez campus. And uh, mm. so they've taken note and uh, they've got a lot of land all around us also. Can you give us a bit of a history of, of why the Cortez land package is, is significant and where Westward's assets sort of fit into this in a, in a sort of a bigger geological picture? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the two main trends in Nevada are the Carlin trend and the Cortez, or the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, which I'm sure all your listeners are aware of that. And then there's kind of the smaller trend within the Battle Mountain Eureka called the Cortez trend. And that's where Barrick's stronghold in Nevada is. Um, I guess now it's technically MGM, but there's still some Barrick owned properties such as Four Mile there. And so when you think about Carlin deposits being these kind of um, pearls on a string, this mini trend within the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, this Cortez trend is um, like one of those on steroids, essentially. So you've got Pipeline, Cortez Hills, Cortez Underground, and then these new discoveries of Cold, Gold Rush and um, Four Mile. And they're all right in line. Um, and, you know, they're all, most of those are 10 million plus ounces. So these Carlin deposits don't form as a single mine or even a couple mines. It's usually a handful. Um, and us being right on that trend, right near Cortez Hills, we think that uh, we've got something similar in our property. Okay, so... Is it safe to say that there's been multiple tens of millions, if not sort of hundreds of millions of ounces that have come out of this, this trend here to date? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, I think pipeline is up to 20 million and Cortez Hills is 10 million. Okay, so that's the three. Okay, so, you know, I probably get pitched 
a Nevada Gold play, I would say, about every 45 minutes or so here in Vancouver. Uh, there's a lot of them. All of them kind of have a similar story. We're in the right place. There's some historic ounces there. Uh, um, you know, Nevada, blah, 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 best exploration jurisdiction in the world. This is a story that many mining investors, many junior mining investors have heard again and again and again. And we've had some of these, we've seen some of these that have worked out, you know, miraculously well, the, the long canyons of the world and, and what have you. And then we've had other ones that have kind of fizzled and gone to nothing. So with respect to, to Westward, you know, what makes this unique? And the reason I'm asking you is because, you know, I know you joined the company relatively recently. Uh, you're, you're an exploration geologist. I know you had a lot of options uh, when the company was talking to you about potential jobs you could be going at. What was it that got excited, that got you excited about this project in particular? And you didn't think, well, you know what, but there's a couple hundred thousand ounces there and it's gonna be one of these sort of dead zombie companies in six months to a year from now. Why, you know, why did this, why is this something you wanted to tack your reputation onto and a, and a career of exploring and working in Nevada? Yeah, it's a great question. There's a kind of twofold answer. You know, there's a geological technical perspective. When you look at this, um, you've got the right compressional setting, right? We need folds, we need faults to create these major ounces in Carlin type deposits. Um, there's some evidence for that from previous operators. We've got the right rocks there. So we have the same host rocks that Cortez Hills and Pipeline and uh, the most recent uh, Dark, Scar, Dark Star, excuse me, deposit have so we're right in the right carbonate package um yeah and then obviously there's 170,000 ounces there so they were hitting on something and then from more of like a kind of cultural perspective how many times have has a deposit been found in nevada where there was you know five to ten operators beforehand and decades of work and that's where we're at as well and we've had companies like santa fe inland gold plaster dome tech come over this property and really build up a really good data set and so there was a lot of, there was a good base level of work done and uh, kind of like standing on the shoulder, uh, shoulders of giants, right? Like we yeah. got this opportunity to expand. And when they first drilled this, it was a soil anomaly in the late eighties. So, well, now we've got, you know, advanced mapping methods, um, you know, all these different uh, technologies that we can rely on all these geophysics. And so I think we can really expand upon what was done and it's, it's a great opportunity. So, Thank you for that. But if I'm going to play the devil's advocate here, right? So you can take the view, all right, this area has been explored significantly by some very experienced, very capable people. You mentioned, I think that there was about 170,000 historic ounces uh, in resource there. Um, you know, what makes you think like that there is continued exploration upside here? You know, has everything that's going to be found been found or, or do you think there, I mean, obviously you think there's more to be found there. Why is that? Why can't you say, well, these guys have looked at this one, two, three, four, five times, you know, they've kicked the can as hard as it can be kicked. You know, wh why is there something else worth going back for? Yeah, economics change. Uh, my first job, I worked for a junior exploration company for about six or seven years, Comoranda Gold, and the VPX there, um, Joe Hebert, I remember we would look at projects and he would say, oh, this is Swiss cheese, we've got to move on. But when you actually look at the depth of some of those projects, how much drilling was done, you know, it was down to 100 meters, 50 meters. And mm. in the 80s, that's what was economic. We needed oxide gold in the surface. And that's changed a little bit. So when I looked at the previous drilling on this project, yeah, there's 370 holes and 85% of them don't go beyond 180 meters. And when we look at some of the geophysics there and we look at where these host rocks are, especially the host rocks in some of the other mines, they're in that same kind of horizon. So there's, um, you know, I, I'm hesitant. We don't want to drill too deep, right? That gets expensive, but 180 meters to 300 meters in that range, that's very economic right now. And I don't think that those targets and those lithologies have been tested adequate, adequately enough. Mm, so that, I mean, that is sort of, I guess, the future of this asset, sort of getting down to that 300 meter zone. Um, and you know, what, let, me, let me take a step back. Have you been seeing a lot of discoveries in Nevada in this range over the last decade or so, um, you know, particularly in this trend? Is this something that mining companies have sort of cottoned on to, that this is, a, this is a place we need to really be looking and allocating exploration dollars, or is this a relatively novel approach? Um, I don't know if it's novel, but it, yeah, it's starting to gain some traction, right? So when we look at, again, a 
you know, the easy stuff has been found. And so, and I know some of your previous guests have talked about this. Um, for example, Cherie talking about, you know, deposits undercover. Mm -hmm. um, I know Chad Peters at Ridgeline, Ridgeline is doing some really good stuff at, stuff at depth. And then you look at Gold Rush and you look at Four Mile and, you know, those holes are going deep. Um, and they're, those are going to be tier one assets for Barrick here. Um, so again, the economics is changing and, uh, you know, we've got to start thinking about things a different way. I think the future of um, gold deposits in Nevada is going to be old projects, new ideas. And uh, we've just got to kind of accept some of these new changing ideas. And if the economics can back it up, which at this point they can, then it's worth going after. So, okay, thank you for that. And speaking of new ideas, I know that you guys are looking at sort of deploying some relatively new or what I would or what you might say relatively underutilized technology in the sector to really kind of ramp up or amp up the exploration uh, at Westward. Can you guys, can you Dave get into some of the, the, the technological uh, tools that you're going to be utilizing for this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. So as I said, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done here, a lot of drilling, a lot of good geochem, um, some early geophysical methods that were done kind of early 2000s. <laughs> So yeah, we're trying to utilize the legacy data and then bring the project up to the new technologies that are available in the modern age here. So we've got three work programs going right now. Um, and this is in advance of what will be our, our maiden drill program in the spring. We're trying to maximize um, our targets, right? And so the first thing that we did um, is hyperspectral core imaging. So there, we had access to 10,000 feet of core and about 30,000 feet of RC holes from previous operators. And now that's a lot of data, right? And there's logs for all of that and there's assays for all of that. But for me to understand the project and go back through and log all of this stuff, um, you know, I'd have to hire a pretty big team of geos and it would take time. And then one of the issues there is that every geologist is subjective, right? They're gonna see things a little bit differently. So with this core imaging, it's spectroscopy. So we're looking at not only the minerals based on energy reflectance, we're also looking at how those minerals might change. So is there a chemistry change? Is there a grain size change? And it's all quantifiable and objective. So now we can take this objective data and we can pair it with other data, for example, assays. So yeah, geologists log solidification and they said, oh, it's pretty solidified. Let's give it a two out of a one to three scale. Well, I can now look at the core imaging data and say, well, it has this number. And when I see this number, we've got this level of gold. Now I'm getting close to this number in a different drill hole and it didn't hit gold. So is there something else happening there or did the drill hole just miss or should we keep that drill hole going? So we can kind of work on our vectoring and use this technology to uh, kind of refine some previous targets and then also create some new ones um, once we get all that into the 3D model. Yeah, and when do you expect that to be completed by? Are you in that process now or, or is it just- So I'm already start? looking at the data. Yeah, so I joined June 1st. Uh, that was the first thing that we did was get this over to a company called TerraCore that's here in Reno, where our core was. And uh, yeah, I've been looking at the data for about a month and a half now, and we're getting it into the 3D model. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm working with their geologists uh, who have quite a bit of experience around the globe, especially here in Nevada. And uh, it's good to get a second set of eyes. So yeah, so that was a pretty quick process. Again, so you know, 40,000 feet of drilling and to have that result within a couple of months um, was very valuable to us. Has what you've seen so far surprised you or changed your view at all on what you were expecting going into this project? Not necessarily surprised, but confirmed. Um, okay. So we're able to break out the lithologies really well, which if you look at some of the logs across the different operators, they were calling the lithologies different things at different, uh, the same depths. So we refined that. And then also we can look at the, um, the level of alteration within a single lithology. And so I wouldn't say I'm surprised, but I'm excited by the things that we're seeing. Um, and we're actually kind of getting some new targets, as I mentioned, and refining some previous ones. Okay. Something else, uh, you know, I've been reading your press releases pretty carefully over the last few months. And something else I've noticed is you guys have been signing on some pretty capable, pretty established Nevada exploration uh, legends in a lot of ways as as advisors and, and, and members of the team. Can you give guys at home a bit of an overview of what you guys have done there to sort of really build out your Nevada expertise?
So when I joined the team in June, there was already a pretty good advisory committee with a gentleman named Dr. Chris Osterman and um, Alan Carter as well. And they have a long story um, career over the globe. They've been involved with multiple successful companies, um, found some deposits. And then uh, through my connections here in Nevada, uh, I've worked with a gentleman named Richard Bedell at, uh, um, at Terracor and uh, some other companies. And he was involved with the Goldex team that found Long Canyon. So it was very successful um, discovery here in Nevada, very, very big for kind of Eastern Nevada and expanding our thoughts about Carlin deposits and where they may occur. And then when I was with Miranda Gold, I worked with a gentleman named Steve Kaler and he's just joined our team as well. And so Steve uh, worked with multiple companies, uh, notably Newmont and Placer Dome. And he was part of the uh, team that discovered Cortez Hills, which is an analog for us. So having his knowledge and access to that is very important. And then his most recent endeavor was with Gold Standard Ventures and the Pinion and Dark Star deposits. So we're really excited to have him on. He's already been extremely helpful. Um, and yeah, I think we've got a good team of, uh, of you know, known mind finders. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to dig into that a little bit because to your point, these guys are known mind finders. They're all kind of around retirement age. They've been at this for a while. They've had a lot of success. What is it that you told them? What did you show them that got them to, uh, you know, step off the golf course and decide to step on as an advisor uh, to Westward? Yeah, you know, I'll be honest. I think they both took my calls as a personal favor. Um, and then I just sent them the 43101 reports that exist for Toyabi. And each of them called me back the next day and said they were interested. So I think that that speaks to the project. And then, of course, now that they've seen the data, they're getting even more excited. So, um, you know, it was a pretty one of the easiest sales I've ever had to do in my career. <laughs> yeah, it kind of sounds like the project spoke for itself a little bit on that. Absolutely. So... For you know, investors that are listening at home, for potential investors that are contemplating this story, you know, what can we expect to see at a Westward over the coming year? You know, what what's the game plan for you guys to sort of create value here in, in your assets and in the company? Yeah, so we mentioned the core imaging, uh, we mentioned the legacy data review. We've got two other work programs going right now. So we're doing an airborne hyperspectral survey as well, and the idea there is, you know, it's seventy five hundred acres, three thousand hectares, so. Not all of it's been, in my opinion, accurately mapped. So this will point out some areas of interest. We can also take some of the core imaging data and apply it to what we're seeing at the surface. Um, and then right now on site, we've got an IP crew going. And the idea there is we're going after the Turquoise Canyon property, but we're doing a couple of lines across Toyabi and across the existing resource. So we can kind of calibrate that um, IP on the Turquoise Canyon side of things. Right. Now that's important because the next step in the spring is we'll um, be planning a drill program over the winter and be looking to put, put some holes in the ground. So we understand Toyabi pretty well. Um, we'd like to see what's over on the turquoise side. So And to put this into perspective for people less familiar with the asset, sort of uh, Toyabi is the ground, the land package with the established historical resource on. Turquoise Canyon is in fact adjacent to that and connecting to that. And there's there's sort of geological anomalies there, or, or but there has not yet been any drilling. Am I correct in that? Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, they share a boundary, um, so they're touching. And uh, yeah, Turquoise Canyon has a lot of the characteristics that we see at Toyabi, and it's never seen a drill. Hmm. And have these land packages ever? Uh, you know, you might not know the answer to this, but historically, have they ever been together? Have they ever been sort of explored as one contiguous project, or have they always been in separate hands? As far as we know, they've always been in separate hands. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because when I look at this, you know, 3,000 hectares in Nevada, you don't see land packages of that size in this part of the world very often. I mean, you, you've been in Nevada a lot more than I have. Is this pretty rare in your opinion, or, or is this sort of the standard go find a mine land package? This is a go, go, excuse me, go find a mine land package, but it's not standard. I mean, when you look at properties across Nevada, generally you're looking at you know, 100 claims to 150 claims is what a lot of the companies do. And this one is about, uh, we're getting close to 400 claims covering this property. Okay. Um, well, Dave, is there anything we didn't talk about today that, that I should have touched on that I should mention? Uh, no, I don't think so. We've covered quite a bit of it. I think, uh, you know, we present uh, an interesting situation here. And uh, I think it's, as I said, I think it's a great opportunity. And um, just stay tuned for more information coming out. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, what kind of gets me excited about this and, and one of the reasons I wanted to invest so badly in Westward and sort of back this team is I would guess what the average age of your team is probably around 35 years old. It's got to be one of the youngest exploration crews uh, operating in North America right now, to my, to my knowledge. Am I right on that? Yeah, I'm the old guy, which is unusual, right? When I came in <laughs> as a 22-year-old with Miranda Gold, I think the closest person was in their 40s. And uh, so for me to be the old man of the crew, um, it's good. But again, to counter that, we've got some good gold uh, mine finders and um, some, yeah, some really good uh, experience on the team. Even Yeah. And worth giving a shout out to Colin Moore, your CEO, uh, you know, a longtime colleague of mine, Colin. I'm biased. I like him. He's a mining engineer like me uh, who went into investment banking. He worked in Waterton and Pacific Roads, a ton of experience in Nevada and evaluating projects all over the world. So, uh, you know, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, I think you guys, when I look at this objectively and guys listening at home, please keep in mind I'm super biased because I do own a lot of this stock. But I think of this as one of the most undervalued um, projects, uh, companies in my portfolio. You've got about a $6 million market cap right now, give or take. You're trading at about $12 a share, or <laughs> I wish, 12 Someday. cents a share, 12 cents a share. Um, and when I look at the expiration potential here, in you know the most prolific gold producing jurisdiction in the world, young team packed with, with old experienced people that have done a lot of this before, the price you can get on now. I'm excited about it. So it's very excited to be a shareholder of Westward and you know, keen to see what you guys uh, push out over the coming months and years. Yeah, appreciate that very much, Jamie. I really appreciate your time today. All right. For people that want to learn more about Westward Gold, where do they look? Be westwardgold.ca. Westwardgold.ca. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. All right, Jamie. Thanks a bunch. All right, guys. That is David Browning from Westward Gold. Do check out westwardgold.ca. Uh, very exciting story, and thank you kindly for watching.